My name is Sabine Fuß. I'm leading a research group at the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. And the current pandemic serves very well to demonstrate the importance of the global commons, where mismanagement inevitably impairs human well-being. And already 15 years ago, the international health regulations were agreed upon. And these regulations constitute a legally binding instrument aiming to assist nations in containing the spread of disease while reducing disruptions of international trade and travel. And very similarly to this, the conference of the parties to the UNFCCC in 2014 culminated in a Paris agreement with a very ambitious target to keep the global temperature increase well below two degrees. Um, however, there has been ample evidence that the pledges for emissions reductions that the individual nations have put on the table in the context of Paris are inadequate to achieve this. At the end of 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published, published a special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees C. The good news is that past emissions on their own do not cause us to exceed the 1.5 degree limit. However, in order to um, achieve 1.5 degrees, uh, we need to, um, as you see in the following graphic that I've brought from the summary for policymakers, rapid and deep emissions reductions already in the very short term and then net zero emissions by mid-century. In addition, we need to actually dip below the zero line. That means we need to clean some of the CO2 that have, we have previously emitted into the atmosphere um, again out. The second graphic um, shows that all of the pathways that we were able to assess in the special report actually have this characteristic. So we need to withdraw CO2 in order to offset residual positive emissions and also to return if we overshoot the 1.5 degree target. In order to see how we can actually withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere, let's remember what happens under climate change. In panel A, you see that we actually withdraw um, fossil fuels from geological formations. Then when we turn them into energy, we release CO2 to the atmosphere, causing temperatures to rise. If we substitute those fossil fuels by biomass, then the additionally grown biomass actually absorbs, sequesters some of the CO2 from the atmosphere. But if we turn it into energy, we again release it to the atmosphere. So if everything works perfectly efficient here, then the best that can happen is that we're carbon neutral. None of the CO2 emissions that are in the atmosphere have been withdrawn. The same can be said about carbon capture and storage, which you see in panel C. Fossil fuel emissions are combusted or turned into energy in some other form, and the CO2 is not released, but captured and again stored in geological formations. That means in the best case, um, nothing changes in the atmosphere. Only if you combine the two, if you actually uh, first store CO2 in additionally grown biomass, and then you don't let it escape into the atmosphere, but capture it and store it on the ground, um, do we have a net negative balance? Of course, um, there are also um, other options that we are um, practicing since a long time, such as planting trees, which absorb additional CO2. But this is the practice that is most prevalent in the pathways that I've shown you um, in, the, in the previous question. Of course, if you look at the pathways that I've shown you in the beginning, where we withdraw up to 20 gigaton CO2 per year by the end of the century, we would need to grow a lot of biomass or a lot of um, forest in order to absorb so much CO2 on a yearly basis. So none of those two practices or technologies can actually be um, a silver bullet. 
In the end, we will need to look at other options as well. Luckily, there are some other options that we could also assess in the IPCC report. Here you see that uh, you can actually also withdraw CO2 directly um, from the atmosphere. This is called direct air capture. And if you subsequently store the CO2 in geological formations, you also have a net negative balance. This happens um, through chemical processes and a lot of energy is required to set these um, into motion. But um, apart from that, this is of course an attractive uh, option because we um, do not need to grow that much biomass, for example. Another option is enhanced weathering, which involves grinding uh, minerals very, very finely and then distributing them over large areas where they can, um, again, through chemical reaction, bind CO2. This is a process that normally happens naturally, but by the grinding, we um, can increase the surface and thereby increase, enhance this weathering process. And also here, the CO2 what per, would be permanently taken out of the carbon cycle. In a study that we conducted with colleagues at the MCC, uh, we looked at uh, the whole literature until um, 2018 to see what are the potentials that um, are found for the different um, technologies and practices that I've described to you just a minute ago. And um, what you see in this graphic are the potentials on the x-axis against their costs. So while I already hinted at this before, that direct air capture with subsequent storage is at the upper end of the cost spectrum, actually we also see quite high potentials here already five gigatons co2 per year or more by the middle of the century and also a lot of the other options come up to uh, something between three and five gigatons co2 per year so a lot of times what we hear then is oh but that's actually good news because if the worst that can happen looking at the pathways is that we have to uh, withdraw 20 gigaton co2 per year then uh, we can actually just add those up. This actually doesn't work because these different practices, technologies, they compete for resources, right? If you grow biomass um, for turning it into bioenergy and combining it with CCS, the same amount of land cannot be used for afforestation. So these numbers rely on individual assessments where uh, the potential is maxed out for each option and uh, you cannot just add them up. There will be certain trade-offs and uh, this has also been behind um, the debate uh, of what should actually uh, a good portfolio of um, CDR options look like. There have been several reasons or factors that have inhibited the rollout of carbon removal. So on the one hand, uh, we have uh, the trade-offs that I already hinted at when I was talking about the potentials. So it is important to also look into other options and to be very aware of these uh, trade-offs. So this is one component of why public acceptance of um, carbon removal has been low. Another component has to do, of course, uh, with um, general considerations of, um, oh, this could just be an excuse for um, delaying mitigation because in the end we can clean up some of the mess that we've uh, inflicted upon Earth. So a little bit of a moral hazard argument, uh, which I think is, is valid and which we of course also have to make transparent. However, what I've shown in the beginning is that um, all of the pathways that lead to 1.5 degrees do remove CO2, but they all also involve very rapid and deep emissions reductions in the short run. So removing carbon cannot be an excuse for not doing anything right now. If we don't do anything right now, then we won't be able to get on any of those pathways to reach 1.5 degrees in the first place. 
The other um, reason why we haven't uh, seen a rollout of uh, carbon removal is, of course, uh, missing economic incentives. So in the absence of a, an escalating carbon price that we see in those scenarios that triggers step by step the installation of these technologies or um, the, the ramp up of these practices, um, we, we, we can't hope that these um, large scales can actually be reached. So we are missing the high carbon price um, that uh, we see materializing in these uh, scenarios. Yes, in the scenarios that I shared with you in the beginning, an escalating carbon price triggers the adoption of removal technologies and practices. Yet, what we see in practice are often negative carbon prices where fossil fuels even receive subsidies. This, together with the fact that we are late with mitigation, might imply that additional support will be needed to quickly ramp up a removal infrastructure. Also, what is needed are national carbon roadmaps where stakeholders can deliberate about a suitable and acceptable carbon removal portfolio and which can ultimately serve as a guidance for investment, both by the private and the public sector. An important final point being that, as long as there are still emissions from fossil fuels, proceeds from carbon trading or taxes can of course be used to finance removals, but going that negative and withdrawing more than we emit implies that the finance has to be found somewhere else. Because what we're actually talking about here is the provision of a public good. A lot of what I have been describing in the past minutes might sound like science fiction indeed. Yet, carbon capture and storage is not an immature technology. The Norwegians have been capturing and storing CO2 from natural gas production at Sleipner for more than two decades, as releasing it would have been expensive under Norwegian carbon pricing back then. Yet, with incentives for storing CO2 generally being low globally, commercial CCS in other parts of the world is mostly occurring in the context of enhanced oil recovery. On the bright side, first applications um, of direct air capture with prospective storage now are abounding both in the US but also in Europe, where a firm called Climeworks has made considerable progress in bringing down costs of what is still the most expensive way of removing CO2. I personally believe that in the future we won't see a single technology like backscale up to remove double digit numbers of uh, CO2 uh, gigatons every year. We will rather see a mix of technologies and practices which fit into their socioeconomic and geographical context and at the same time effectively manage the side effects and trade offs. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.